is uh, Zion Tamos. Um, Shear with the Mahi Sofer on Tashers, Hatashin Samach Tes. Okay. I don't need to hear, it's fine. It's, uh, I'll still project. Okay, now I asked uh, this time to get a list of questions. And uh, it's an interesting list of questions which I got. Though today I also spoke to uh, Rabbi Levanoni and he mentioned to me that uh, one question which is not on here and which guys want answers to is what do you do in a situation where you're at home, you want to keep a certain level of kashas, okay? And you go home, I mean, you come to Yeshiva and you learn that, you know, these things are good to eat, these things are not good to eat, you know, we've got to be more particular. And you go home and you find that, you know, uh, wherever you're living, you know, everybody, the most from people, are eating all these sorts of things which you know could be a problem. What do you do? How do you deal with the situation? It's a problem that everybody has, pretty much. Whether, I mean, whether it's a person who's, uh, who's taken on more on cautious or something has changed or whatever it's going to be. Or even any, any person who's going to visit someone else. I mean, what do you do? I'm, you know, I go to visit people, go to their houses, and I want to talk to them, and, you know, they offer me food. What do I do? So it's a, it's a very important question, and especially when you're at home, right? You come to Yeshiva, you learn about things, and you go home, and you see there's a lot of things you can't eat. So how do you deal with such a situation? The answer is not so simple. I think that it very much depends on the individual, and yet there are many solutions. It depends very much, for instance, let's, let's use an example which is probably more relevant to you guys. You go home, right, and you know your parents are looking after you, they've, uh, they've sent you to Yeshiva without realizing what the implication is going to be when you come home, <coughs> and you want to know what to eat. Now, some parents, you'll say to them, look, I learned in yeshiva that all of these type of things I can't eat or I require special hechsher or it could be a problem. Some parents will accept that and say, okay, you know, whatever you want, that's what we'll do. Some parents won't feel like that. They'll say, look, it's got a rabbi's stamp, you know, look, the rabbi's name written on it. It's going to be kosher. Then others will say, look, I don't understand what you want from me, you know, I mean... What's this kosher business anyway, you know? So it all depends on how, on how your parents are going to deal with it. The most important thing, the most important thing, is that you have to be a mensch. I've heard of, of uh, people going home to their parents and saying, look, you know, what you're doing is no good, you know, it's not kosher enough, I can't eat it, uh, you know, you've got to change everything for me. Parents will not accept that. Most parents won't accept it. And you're not doing the right thing. Now the, the Rebbe always says that when you um, when you do something, it, have to, it has to be but often hamiskabel in the way that a person can deal with it, the way that a person can accept it. And the most important thing is when we uh, when we go home, we speak to our parents and our family. We have to do it in a way that they can deal with what we, we're giving them. Same as you talk to anyone. When you talk to somebody in the street, you talk to anyone, a friend, somebody that you want to, um, to, get the, to get them to understand your point of view, you have to do it in a way that they accept it. It's acceptable to them. And parents are no different. Your family is no different. In fact, the opposite is the case. You know, you have to, even more so, you want them to, you've got a close relationship, you want to continue that close relationship. It's never good to go, uh, you know, in, a, in a, an aggressive manner and, uh, and do it in that way. Sometimes it even means that you know, uh, you might not be able to keep the level of kashas that you want to keep. And that's where you have to know, at what point, what is it that is a problem with this food? Is it a khumrah? Is it something which I'm taking on which is more strict? And that's what I want to do, which is what we want to do. Or is it really a real serious question of kashas? Is this thing really trade? And then you have to balance it according to your relationship with your family to see that, you know, sometimes you might have to pull back a bit or you might not just say, okay, look, you know, they're doing it. I won't eat it. 
just have to do it in such a way that you're not going to offend people. It's not a, there's no mitzvah to offend people. In fact, the opposite. You're not allowed to offend people. It says in uh, Gemara Brachas that Hamalabed Nev Chaver Barabim Kilo Harga. If a person uh, embarrasses somebody in public, it's as if he's killed them. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to embarrass people, not your parents, not your family. So you have to, you know, usually it's worthwhile in such a situation to uh, have a, a Rav that you can speak to and you can discuss the situation who can help to guide you because it's sometimes difficult in your own family to know what is more correct and what is less correct to do. And I always suggest that you should have a Rabbi who can guide you, who understands you, where you're at, who understands the situation of your family, who can help guide you through this, uh, these type of issues. So that's... Uh, if you have any more questions on that, uh, you can always ask and I'll be happy to, uh, to help you out. Now I have a list here of nine questions. There may have been more, but uh, the facts only uh, showed me nine. Um, the first one, some of the questions I won't answer. Uh, I'll go through the questions and then I'll tell you what I will and what I won't answer. First question is, can fish either fresh or frozen be bought at any place? I will answer that question. What is the issue with canned tuna? I will answer that question. Why do people say that whiskey isn't kosher? Yes, we'll talk about that as well. Why don't some Chabadniks eat Rabbi Yurkovich's shvita? I will not answer that question. <laughs> Number five. Can we eat Rav Landau's Hashkocha when he fired someone for wearing a yechi yamukha? I will answer that question. Why do certain Hashkocha organizations say that something is kosher when others say it is treif? Yes, I'll answer that. Why don't Chabadniks eat bells of shchita? Yeah, we can answer that one. Why does Rav Landa not give Hashgach on orange juice? Yes, we'll answer that. What is the difference between uh, Chabad, Shechita, Glat, and Beis Yosef? I won't answer that question. So, those who want to know why I won't answer certain questions can ask me later. <coughs> okay, we'll start from the beginning. Can fish, either frozen or fresh, be bought at any place? What is the issue here? Um, what's wrong with fish? Right? I mean, uh, you buy fish. Allah tells you, the, the Torah tells us, as long as the fish has got fins and scales, it's kosher. So I can just look for fish with fins and scales and buy it, theoretically. Firstly, not necessarily so. There's more to it than that. What are the other problems associated with fish? Fins and scales tells you whether or not the fish is actually a kosher species of fish. Besides that, there are other issues with fish. Number one, a lot of fish have got bugs on them, on them, in them. Um, you have, for instance, salmon has got sea mites on them. They grow salmon today in cages. I mean, usually, you see those pictures of... Uh, mountain streams with salmon jumping up and down through the mountain streams and there's some fisherman there with his uh, fly fishing gear standing in the river fishing salmon that's not the stuff we eat the stuff we eat uh, is very different they take uh, eggs salmon eggs they grow them in, in little containers until they get little fish then they take those fish and they put them in a bigger container when the fish get big enough, they put them in a cage in a river or in the sea, depending on what type of salmon it is, and they feed the fish in this cage and the fish grows until it comes to the, the size that they want to harvest it, then they take it out and they slaughter the salmon. What happens is because the fish are in a closed environment in a cage, it gives the opportunity for sea mites to get onto the fish. A very common thing, a sea mite is a little bug, about that big, and uh, they're very fast moving things actually. They swim along in the water, and if they get on the salmon, they, uh, they get stuck sometimes between the scales of the salmon and the skin of the salmon. 
the scales, one on top of the other, sitting on top of the skin. And they might get underneath there as well. Therefore, all salmon that you buy, whether it comes from Norway or Chile or Canada, which is the most common uh, places to get salmon in Israel, you have to scale it first. When you scale it, any sea mites which are caught there are going to be removed. So that's one problem. You have to make sure that salmon is scaled. Therefore, you can say, no problem, I can buy salmon anywhere. I'll just tell the guy to make sure it's scaled. That's for a whole salmon. Uh, technically, that would be correct. Other problems are, that's if you talk about a whole fish. Now, when you buy salmon, very few people buy a whole fish. Right? It's usually sliced or f in, in fillet, right? a fillet. What's the difference? A slice is where you cut it through the whole body of the fish uh, with the bones. Fillet is when you remove the meat without the bones. Now, the um, in a situation where you move the, uh, the meat without the bones, it's always done in the factory where they harvest the fish. It's not done over here in most cases. Therefore, where that's done, you have to make sure that, in fact, it's done in a proper way. I'll get to that in a second. Other fish also have got bugs on them. A lot of fish. Carp has got bugs on it. Uh, most fish, sea fish, or fish which are grown, have got bugs on it. In Israel, a lot of fish are grown in, uh, in hatcheries. And they grow the fish there, like in ponds, and they, uh, they harvest the fish and bring it to the store. Any place where the fish is grown in a closed environment, there's a lot of possibility for bugs. And there are many different types of bugs. Those that, those that grow in, a, in ponds, those that grow on the sea, different types of bugs, and different types of bugs are attracted to different types of fish. Some of them are very hard to see, unless you're knowledgeable and you know what to look for, you have a problem. Therefore, from the perspective of bugs, it is always an issue where you buy the fish because if you don't know how to check it yourself then you have to make sure that the person you're buying the fish from or the place does have somebody who knows how to check the fish when you talk about bugs on fish it's the same as bugs on vegetables there's isurim to eat it they're not allowed to eat it there's between five or six uh, averas for each single bug so it's a big issue you can't just go and buy fish if you don't know how to check it, or you don't know which fish is possibly problematic. You wanted to ask a question. If it's wild caught fish, is that fine? Or is that no, as I'm saying, uh, some of them, even the wild caught fish, has other bugs. There's different types of bugs on different types of fish. The first thing you have to do is to learn what types of bugs you can get on what types of fish. Some fish don't have the problem of bugs. For instance, um, there's a fish uh, that you get here in. in uh, uh, fillets, which comes in fact from Argentina or from uh, South Africa, doesn't have bugs on it. So you don't have a problem with it. Yeah? It depends what sort of fish it is. Again, the question is how, where it comes from. Is it, is it, is it a, a fish? Yeah, I'm saying, but is it a fish which is uh, grown in a, an enclosed environment or is it a wild fish? What are we talking about? And that's what you have to know. It basically, like everything else, you have to study what it is and know where the problems are. Now, that's as far as bugs are concerned. As far as the fish itself is concerned, what do they use to cut that fish? Let's say I go to a fish store in Canada, okay? They just have kosher fish. They could have, they'll have non-kosher fish there as well, they'll have uh, 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 crustaceans, they'll have lobsters, they, they might have uh, uh, other fish without scales like eels or shark or things like that. When are cutting the fish, they're probably using the same equipment to cut, cut the fish. They put on the same board, they're using the same knives, they're using, if it's frozen they might use a saw if it's got big bones. And again, you're, you know, one minute the customer before you might have bought a piece of a shark, for instance, which is a non-kosher fish, <coughs> and they cut it on a, on a saw, <coughs> and then you come in and you want a kosher fish, and they cut it on the same saw. 
So bits of the shark which has been cut on the saw are going to go into your fish. So you've got a problem. Uh, in Australia, where I come from, uh, fish is a very common food. And what a lot of the uh, uh, people used to do in the community <coughs> is they had their own boards and knives, which they would take to the fish shop. And when they would buy the fish, they would take it and ask them to use their equipment. Because it was a common thing, that's what they did. And uh, they cut the fish with their stuff, and then there wasn't a problem. They would choose a whole fish and get it cleaned and prepared by the fish store. Yeah. Why is what a problem? <coughs> because there, there's remnants of the previous fish, and you don't know what it is. And that will be st stuck to your fish. Or usually, uh, you know, usually as soon as you get back, uh, as soon as you get home from the fish, or usually, you know, the fish for the sea, wash it off and everything, this is what come up. Okay. Uh, do, do an experiment. Okay. Take a, uh, take a fish, get a fish board, okay, a knife, take a fish, put some red dye on it, or blue dye on it, even better still. Put some blue dye on the fish, put it on the board, right? Cut it up on the board, put some blue dye on it on the board, take it off, you'll see blue dye on the board. Then take another fish and cut it up on that board, see how much of the blue dye gets onto the fish you've cut up. You think that any will, any will get onto it? I would imagine a fair amount. That's what you're, that's essentially what you're doing. <coughs> you won't be able to do it in such a way that there's nothing of the previous fish there. That's the issue. And you want to make sure that, I mean, look, when you're eating the fish, you want it to be 100% kosher fish. I don't want it to be 99.9% .9 kosher fish. So that's why, essentially, there, this is one way you can do it. You have a, a solution. Um, as far as, yeah, you want to ask a question? I was just going to say, as far as frozen fish, um, you have uh, a different issue. Uh, you just have to make sure that the, the, I mean, when was it frozen? Where was it frozen? Where did it come from? Again, you have to have an idea of what the fish is. Um, you, uh, there are some places that they make a lot of frozen fish. Like here you have a, a fish called Marloza, which is in fact uh, known in English as haddock. Right? It comes from either Argentina or South America. South Africa, I mean. And it comes as a fillet with a piece of skin on it. Uh, that fish can be... Um, uh, it doesn't have a problem with bugs. It's commercially produced in, in factories which only produce that type of fish. So when they fillet it also, they don't use knives and boards. But it goes through a filleting machine. And uh, therefore, it's not a problem. You can buy that. Uh, the only thing that we have seen here is that when they repack it, I mean, these fish come in, in boxes and cartons of 20 kilos or something, and they repack it into bags. People buy it in the supermarket, they're buying bags. Um, we have seen a number of times that people have brought us a bag of this fish, and it wasn't that only that fish in there, there were other fish in there as well. Also similar fillets, and fish which really did not have scales on them. Was what they did when they packed it, when they repacked the fish, they obviously got mixed up. They put, they, they got a carton of this and a carton of that, and somehow got mixed up, and there was a mixture in the bag. And I've seen that here a number of times in Eretz So again, something one has to be careful about. Uh, you can you can see it. I mean, you can actually see the fish. It's a, you can just buy it and you can see that it's the right fish or not. But it's something you have to look at. You can't just take a bag and say, okay, I can use it because that's what it is. You still have to check. With? Well, they preserve it? They preserve it in ice, cold. They don't, I do not know, I mean, normal frozen fish does not have chemicals or other ingredients on it. No, usually don't. What they do, the way that they preserve fish, slightly differently. Uh, if you get a fillet of sole, and sole is a, is a bottom dwelling fish, lives on the, on the seabed. Now, sole has got uh, two sides to it. Actually, just a bit of history of a sole. A sole starts off as a fish which swims upright like that. It's got the fins on here, fins on the bottom, and the head sticking out the front. It swims like that. 
uh, as it uh, in its youth, I think it takes a few months, the fish essentially flips over to the side and its eye, its head moves over a little. Its eyes move from being one each side to being on the top. Actually, eyes just move. And so the eyes, two eyes are on the top and the, and the fish moves down to the bottom of the ocean floor. And it basically swims across on the, on the ocean floor. What happens with this fish is when they sell it, when you have a look at the fish, it has two colors. The upper side of the fish is usually gray and a mottled kind of color. The bottom side of the fish is pure white. Because it's on the bottom of the, of, of the seabed. Uh, you can buy the, fillet, the fillets of the fish, either white fillets or gray fillets. The difference is the white fillets, you don't, it's very hard to see the scales because they're very small and it looks like it's just the skin. But there actually are scales there as well, you have to look for them. These fillets are quite tender. So what they do is when they freeze it, they freeze the fish as a fillet, then they dip it in water, and then immediately put it in a container. With the dipping of it in water puts a coating of ice over each fillet. When you buy it in Israel, right, you have to be very careful because they sell it by weight, and you have at least 10 to 20% water because that's what sticks to the fillet itself. It's just, a, a, just another issue, but I mean, that's what preserves it. It keeps the fish in a very good condition, it's got this coating of ice on it. But you're paying for that quite dearly. So that's uh, the frozen fish, but I don't know of preservatives. Um, the other issue with fish is that if you're buying frozen fish, you have to make sure that there is a piece of skin on it. Usually when you buy frozen fish, you might as a fillet. Now, fish, which has been skinned, you can't re it doesn't have any skin left on it, cannot be used because you can't recognize what it is. Some people say, look, I'm an expert. I know what this fish looks like. I don't have a problem. It's not the case. There are definitely uh, very often kosher fish where the flesh of the fish uh, and the flesh of a non-kosher fish look similar. And you might think uh, that you can tell and you cannot. So therefore halacha requires that when you buy fish as a fillet, not as a whole fish, there's a piece of skin still attached to the fish, not just sitting in the bag, but attached to the fish with scales on it, where you can recognize that the scales are there. Therefore, you know that it's a kosher fish. You might ask, what about the fins? Do I need fins? And the answer is no. The Torah tells you that the two signs of a kosher fish are that it has fins and scales. And the Gemara asks the question, why do I need the fins? You say, well, it's a sign of the kosher fish. The Gemara then says, no, not necessarily. There are fish which have fins but no scales, like shark, eels. But there are no fish that have scales but no fins. There's no such thing. So any fish which has scales also has fins. So therefore, why does the Torah tell me fins and scales? So just say scales. Say, so how do you recognize a kosher fish? It's got scales. The Torah answers that because these two, um, these two things are indigenous to fish. Only fins and scales are things which are just on fish. Snakes also have scales, but snakes don't have fins. So therefore the Torah used both expressions, both fins and scales, in order that you should know that these are the two issues, these are the two things to do with fish. Because uh, if it says, if the Torah only said scales, you might think it means fins. And if it said fins, you might mean it scales. So the Torah says it has fins and scales, therefore it covers us completely so that we know that the fish is a kosher fish. So it has to be attached. You'll see in Israel where they sell um, Nile perch, known as Nesichat HaNilus. Uh, they sell it in pieces, on fillets. You'll see there's always a piece of skin attached to it. Um, the is because of uh, the fact that uh, it might be cut or something. They might have cut it. 
But if it's just the, uh, the fillet itself, uh, with a piece of skin attached to it, essentially no. The factories that do it are in Africa, and they, uh, they only do this. They catch the fish, and they only uh, process Nile perch. Now, usually there's not a problem with that. Yeah? No. Not visible, yes, but uh, the question is, what does it mean, not visible? If you have a bug which is as small as a, a, a little dot, and it's visible to the eye, you might not be able to recognize it as a bug, but if you can see it, it's considered a bug. Bugs are considered, oh, this is not just in fish, it's in everything, vegetables as well, and fruit. As long as you can see something, notice it to the naked eye, uh, if it is a bug, it, it's forbidden, it's awesome. Uh, you might need a microscope in order to recognize what it is, to see its head and feet and what it's going to be. So it's the same thing with the fish. As far as bottle is concerned, it is a, it is a, a unit on its own, it's a barrier, it says it according to Allah. It's a unit on its own, it's a bug, it's a whole thing. Therefore, it is not going to become bottle. It was only partly part of bugs that you could say it becomes bottle. But a whole bug does not become bottle. So that won't help either. You just have to make sure that the fish doesn't have bugs. So how do you do it? In Israel, it's not a problem. Because in Israel, you've got a lot of stores that sell fish and they have that share. And there they have mashgichim who come in and they check what comes into the store and make sure that it's bug free. And that's what, uh, that's what they sell. Chutzlai uh, says, as I say to you, you've got to be, in most cases, if you remove the skin from the fish uh, and you clean out the stomach part of the fish completely, then you won't have a problem with bugs. There's almost no bugs that are actually stuck in the flesh of the fish itself. So if you just uh, clean out, make sure there's no skin and the inside, the cavity of the stomach is completely cleaned out, then usually you've, you've covered almost every possibility of bugs. So that's also another possibility in the if you're not able to uh, check for bugs for yourself. Any questions on fish before we go to our next topic? Yeah? Uh, on what board? What surface? Does have to clean the surface? and. Uh, yeah. yeah, technically you could do that. Yeah, yeah, that would be enough. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? We've covered fish, yes. Um, I have a question. Um, how can we get a slaughter fish? How can we what? Slaughter fish, chef, the same chef, poultry, and meat. The reason that you have to chef uh, poultry and meat is because it says on the Torah that's what has to be chef then. Uh, I always like to go from that point of view, what was the Torah tells us we have to do? We do things not for other reasons other than what the Kaddish Baruch Hu told us to do it. That's the reason we do everything. The Torah doesn't tell us you have to shecht fish, you have to shecht fish. From another perspective, then that's, that's the, the premise. As we go further, uh, we shecht animals, one of the purposes is to remove the blood. Because there's an issue in the Torah to eat or consume blood. Uh, there's no issue in the Torah to consume fish blood because fish blood is not considered blood la halacha, it's considered liquid. It's not a blood, it's not blood. So, therefore, uh, another reason you don't have the necessity to remove blood from fish. If uh, blood of a, of a chicken falls uh, onto uh, onto a, a surface, onto a plate or something, which is hot. You have a trafe plate. If blood of fish falls onto it, it's not. Because the blood of fish is not considered blood halachic. Therefore, there's no requirement for shrita. How does it work? Have you ever been have you ever been to a place where they shech cows? I can see. If you do, you'll see what happens. The blood goes out. 
it's uh, it pumps out. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question. The reason that you have to cut the simonim, right, is because by doing so you're going to cut the veins. <laughs> That's, uh, the idea is that the way that the anatomy of the animal, our Kodesh Baruch Hu created it, is that when you cut through Rav Simonim, then you're going to cut through the major arteries, which is going to pump the blood out. There's a concept in Halacha, which is, uh, Gemara talks about, sea creation. You know the concept? Uh, Gemara discusses the concept uh, that uh, a person says, look, uh, I didn't mean to kill a chicken, I just cut it head off. I'm killing it. I'm just cutting its head off. So the Gemara says, see creation of Eloi Yom, but you're going to cut its head off and it's not going to die. You know, I mean, this is the certain things which are givens. That this is going to happen no matter what. It's the same way here. With a, uh, when you cut through the simonim, you're going to cut through the major arteries and that will remove the blood. Yeah. Not necessarily. Probably not. Um, the after meat has got, the meat is moist, right? It has a certain percentage of liquid in it. Now, what is that liquid? It could be the water. I mean, the, the meat sat in water after it was shechted. They shechted it. They um, took out the veins and the fats and things which have to be removed. And they sat it in water for half an hour. And they salted it for an hour. Then they sat it in water again and they rinsed it off. It had a lot of water. Now, meat is absorbent. It will absorb a certain amount of water. Besides the fact that meat itself is about uh, 40% water as it is, before you even start. So the liquid that you're going to have in minced meat is most probably either from the absorbed water or from the fact that it has its moisture in it uh, in itself. So it's unlikely, especially if it's minced, that it will be blood. Because blood is possible to be found in a, in a solid piece of meat. You might have an artery or a vein which is in there where you have blood in the artery, in which case you have to remove it, even after salting. But uh, once meat is minced, you won't have that issue. Again, uh, it depends where uh, where you got the fish from. If it's a whole fish, uh, and you make sure that the kalima are uh, clean and uh, kosher pesach, essentially not. But uh, one thing, there are customs pesach with fish. Since it's in Hungary, people from Hungary don't have a custom not to eat fish on Pesach. Why is that? I was interested. You what? No, Hungary, you know, a bit of geography. Hungary is inland. Uh, no. no not, not that I know of. But that's an interesting one. I'll, I'll mention something there in a second. The, uh, the, I, I checked into this a little bit and I found that in the olden days they used to bring fish from the sea. Now fish, when you transport it, well, they didn't have refrigeration right, and uh, freezing facilities. So what they did is if the fish is just sitting there with its mouth closed, then gases build up in the fish's stomach and the fish starts to rot. So they used to hold the fish's mouth open with a piece of bread. That was the, the custom. And so therefore, because of that, fish was essentially chomets. So in Hungary, they didn't eat fish on Pesach because of that. Somebody mentioned alcohol. Uh, that can also be an issue today. I was in a, uh, a salmon plant in Chile about two years ago. And we wanted to see if we could use the, the fillet of the salmon for Pesach. And as I'm watching the cleaning process of that plant, I'm seeing people walk around little spray bottles and spraying it on the stainless steel surfaces. And I said, what's that? What are you spraying on the surfaces? And he said, well, we're cleaning the surfaces, getting rid of the bacteria. 
I said, what's in the bottle? Alcohol. Alcohol is edible. It's a very good disinfectant. It kills bugs. Uh, so they use it on the surfaces where they're uh, preparing the salmon to make sure that they kill all the bacteria that's on the surface to reduce the amount of bacteria. Now, if that alcohol is made from chomets, it's a problem. Or if it has even touched chomets, it could also be a problem of yain nesach if it's made from wine. It can be many different problems with the alcohol. So that could be a problem. Therefore, one has to be careful. Yeah. Even if they were? Even, even if the guy that's selling you the fish doesn't have fish in it, tells you it's a salmon you bite. Uh, the question is, is he a religious Jew or not? So if he's a non-Jew, uh, then you can't rely on that. If he's a religious Jew who owns the store, uh, then you can rely on that. Because uh, a religious Jew is what is known as Beches Kaskashus. He's we expect that he's going to be doing the right thing and he's, uh, he's going to be telling you the truth. But a non-Jew doesn't have any, any reason to tell you the truth. He just wants to sell you the fish. So he'll tell you whatever he wants so that you'll buy the fish. But a from Jew won't do that. So it all depends on that. You should buy, in a situation you should, like that, you should only buy a fish which you see whole with it all intact and get them to clean it in front of you. Okay, shall we go on to the next topic? What is the issue with canned tuna? Okay. What is the issue with canned tuna? He said, there's an issue with canned tuna. I don't have an issue with it. I just don't eat the stuff. Tuna is like this. The, um, the different types of tuna. There's tuna, which is a large fish, which can weigh 100, 200, 300 kilograms. That's a stuff they sell to the, to the Japanese for sushi. That's one type of tuna. Then you have the tuna that uh, most of us eat, because we're not Japanese, and that is in a can. Now, that is usually a different type of tuna. It's usually a small tuna which weighs two or three kilograms of fish. A little thing like this. The large tuna, when they catch it, the only way to catch large tuna is they corral the tuna in a net. Then, with uh, lines, fishing lines, they, uh, uh, they put bait on the lines and then they, they bait the tuna, they catch the tuna and throw it up on the boats. They take that tuna and they freeze it on the boat in a, uh, a freeze storage room. Uh, and that's how they keep it in good condition until they take it to market. The small tuna, which is uh, used for cans, is caught in nets. There's different types of nets which are used. One is called a purse seine net. The reason it's called a purse seine is because it closes like a purse. In the old day purses, you had a string, like a drawstring, which you pull it and the purse closes. The same thing with this net. The net is put into the sea, it's like round into the sea. At the bottom of the net, there's a cord, and the top of the net, there's a cord. And what they do is they start pulling the net from the bottom, and as it, uh, they pull the net, the bottom of the, the net closes up like that and turns it into a, like a purse, and all the fish is in there. Then they close the top of the net, and it basically closes the fish entirely. They lift it up onto a boat with a, uh, with a winch. That's how it works. Then what do they do to the fish? Most of the uh, boats that catch these fish have got a pool of water, a tank of water on the boat. They fill it up with seawater, and then they put in 20% salt. By doing that, they can reduce the temperature of this uh, water to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And by doing that, the water still remains liquid because of the salt in it, the high salt percentage. Then they take the fish, the tuna, and they throw it in this water. And the tuna freezes immediately because it's minus 20 degrees. Okay, so it freezes and becomes a solid, a solid fish. Now, the uh, the problem is, that as I, from what I said, is that uh, it's possible and it's very common that tuna is caught with other fish that are not kosher. 
Because tuna is a, uh, a fish which is a carnivorous fish and eats other fish. Tuna swim. They never sleep. Tuna keep swimming all the time. They constantly have to move because they have a very big need for oxygen. So they get it as they swim in the water. They don't sleep. And so even as they swim, they swim into schools of other fish and they eat. They just open their mouths and they swallow other fish as they're going along as well. So very often there's other fish with the tuna. Now, the f- tuna don't have the halacha that they only eat kosher fish. Unlike we do. They're not Jewish. So therefore, it could very well be that today they're going to dine on something else. It's not a kosher fish. So when you catch the tuna, you catch it with other fish. Then they throw it into this uh, tank of water with salt in it. The problem, la halacha, is a simple one. If I take a non-kosher fish and a kosher fish and I cook it in a pot together, what's happened? The kosher fish becomes forbidden. It's true. Because it gets the time, it gets the taste of the non-kosher fish. Right? That I think everybody understands. If I would take a kosher fish and a non-kosher fish and I'd put it in a bucket of salty water, it does the same thing. Salt also uh, is considered like cooking. It's like I would cook the fish together. So therefore, the kosher fish would also become non-kosher. That's what happens with these tanks. I've taken a tank with salt water in it. I've thrown fish in. If there are non-kosher fish amongst these kosher tuna, then I've essentially made the tuna not kosher. So you can say, well, who says they're going to catch kosher, non-kosher fish? You know, I mean, so maybe they aren't. And you might be right. But on the other hand, you might not be right. Why? Because there's no one there to see it. And you might say it's bottle bashish and whoever said that. And it's not necessarily so. How do you know it's bottle bashish? Did anyone measure it? Was anyone there to see that this was the case? It could very well be that one day all the tuna that comes into a particular boat is only tuna and nothing else. They got it there. There wasn't amongst all, all the fish that it's with are kosher fish. Not a problem. All of that tuna is kosher. But tomorrow, they might catch tuna and there might be 20% non-kosher fish amongst them. All of that tuna is trafe. There is nobody that checks it. Nobody is on these boats. The, only, the first time the tuna is checked is when this, the, the, the fish is removed from this boat and taken and put into a mother boat. Right? And one of the reasons they use salt water is because it's pumped into the mother boat. They have a very large uh, a tube, if you like, pipe, and they pump the fish through this pipe into the mother boat with the water. The whole lot goes into the mother boat. So it goes very quickly. The mother boat reaches shore, and then they have to remove the fish from there and take it to the canning factory. That is the first time that any type of separation or sorting happens with the fish. That's when they sort it. They sort it there, and then they sort it when it goes into the factory. But by that time, it's too late. Not with salt. If it was just plain water, it would be 24 hours. With salt, no. Salt is a davar kharif. So it's essentially straight away. So therefore, that's the problem with tuna. So therefore, uh, Ravlanda does not give a heksha on tuna. Now, it's possible that there are places which uh, I've been to many plants and places in the world which do not allow fishing of tuna or other fish with per se nets. It's forbidden according to law. The reason being that per se nets is uh, according to certain government officials. The per se, firstly, um, it's harmful to the fish. Uh, they say that it. Uh, some say that it causes uh, fishermen to go over the fishing quota. Others say that it, uh, it also uh, catch uh, other sea creatures like uh, uh, porpoises and uh, things like that, dolphins and various other things which they don't want to catch. So therefore, they forbid it. This is a case in most of Africa and most of uh, South America. In those places, the way they catch the fish 
is they have small boats which go out. They have ice. They pack in ice in the boat before they go fishing. They go out and then they catch the fish. They corral the fish with a net. Then they catch them one by one and put it onto the boat. And they just keep it in ice uh, until they bring it the same day or the next day to the packing plant, to the canning plant. There's no issues with those places. Firstly, because they're, they're lifting the fish up onto the boat one at a time, they immediately are doing a sorting process. They have no interest to have fish other than tuna because the, the, the plant, the canning plant wants to buy tuna. They don't want to buy other fish as well. They're canning tuna. So therefore, they, they sort the fish as it's coming onto the boat and then also uh, when it goes to the factory. The other thing is it's not kept in ice water. It's only kept on ice itself, so therefore there's also no issue with it. So it can technically be done in those places. The reason we haven't done it until now is because uh, the factories have not, that we've checked, haven't uh, agreed to kasher the plant the way that we require. So it's a technical uh, problem of, uh, of having a plant that we can kasher. That's the issue with tuna. I knew you were going to ask that. I'm not going to answer the question. I can just tell you what the problem is. <laughs> you what? Uh, there can be many, many factors, many factors. Commercial factors. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's, that's exactly what it is. But, uh, no, there's, look, there, there's a lot of things that... Uh, are in the decision making process, they all boil down to exactly that. They boil down to how much profit they're going to make, in most cases. And that's what companies are there for. They're there to make money. If they feel that they can make more money on one hatcher than another, they'll take that for whatever reason. Uh, that's usually the case. But that's what they're there for. That's what companies are about. They're there to make a profit. Yeah, sure. Uh, you see, that's also part of uh, marketing. You, know, you write badats, and people think it's badats in the Haredes. You see, so many stores, it's called Behechsher Habadats. And you have a look, what badats is it? It's badats of somebody's next door neighbor. I don't know which badats it is. It could be, uh, you know, any badats. Badats means Beit Din Sedek. With Beit Din Sedek. I mean, uh, we sit down on Erev Yom Kippur, we also have a badats. You know, we do Hataras and the Dorim, right? You have a group of three people or ten people, you have a badats. We do Hataras and the Dorim, Be'echsha, a badats. Well, it's got nothing to do with uh, anything to do with Tatras, right? But uh, badats doesn't really mean anything, and it's really, it really puts people off. It gives people the wrong impression. But, you know, they're trying to market themselves as being kosher, so they write that, you know. Uh, why, do they, uh, so why do they what? So that they can, the water will remain liquid at minus 20 degrees. That way they can pump out the fish that are also, the fish freezes straight away. The fish would rot. This way they freeze, no, the, the, if the, they put the water down at 20 degrees, minus 20 degrees, it'd be solid, it'd be ice. Right? But this way, Keeps the water liquid. It also gives the ability for the fish to freeze solid very quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, when you say there's in the water, you think about like the for instance, All right. Very good question. Okay. Um, the question is this, uh, you're tasting salt, right? but it could very well be that you're also tasting the fish within the salt. Um, salt itself has trait of fish in it, and it's harif. The salt becomes not kosher. Okay? One of the things we, uh, we actually asked uh, when we researched this subject was, what happens, I mean, maybe the taste Maybe none of the salt goes into the fish. I mean, the fish is frozen solid. As it hits that salt, that water, it gets frozen almost immediately. So maybe it actually doesn't get any salt taste in it whatsoever. If I don't have any taste of the salt in the fish, so I can't say at all 
that the fish is trafe because it, it doesn't absorb any salt taste. So we had to work out whether or not it absorbs the salt taste. Uh, during my research on the subject, I uh, one of the ways that you can uh, you do research in kashas to see if things are uh, are okay or not, or where there's problems, is you look at um, at problems. For instance, I look for is when I go through a factory, okay. Uh, one of the places I look at is I look in the waste uh, waste bins of the factory. I want to see what ingredients they're using. One way I, I look on the shelves, on the storage shelves in the storeroom. Then I go and have a look in the uh, in, in the garbage to see what wrappers and what packaging is in there. Because well, that tells me more what they've been using and what's sitting in the storeroom. Well, it's in the storeroom, they could remove anything they don't want me to see. But if it's in the waste uh, the waste area. They're not going to remove it. They won't think I'll look there. So that's one thing I do. When I'm looking for fish, I did a search, uh, some research on what happens, what are the problems with frozen fish legally. And I found a number of legal precedents where people have been taken to court. Fish companies who catch tuna were taken to court because the fish uh, which they sold the factory was too salty. Why were they taking the court? Because what they did was they kept it too long in the salt water. The fish was a bit older. It was frozen and it was solid, but because it had been sitting in the salt water longer, it had absorbed more salt. The longer it sat there, they actually could graph. The, the longer it sat in the salt water was a direct, uh, you could see, a direct comparison to the amount of salt in the fish. So therefore, even the solidly frozen fish absorbed salt. So there it's absorbing taste. Absorb taste, so you have a problem of halacha. Okay, where was I? Um, that was with tuna. Now tuna, one doesn't have to sort of give up eating tuna altogether. I eat tuna. You can buy, you go to any store, you go down here to Schneerson's Fish Shop, and you can buy tuna steaks, which come from the big tuna, what? Yes. <laughs> You're right. But if you want to, you know, that badly, you can buy this stuff and you cook it up. It takes about half an hour. And you just grind it up, put some mayonnaise with it, and you've got tuna. So anyone who's really uh, having cravings or for tuna, you can definitely do that. Uh, you say it's very expensive. When you buy a can of tuna, have a look on the can. What percentage is uh, is fish, and what percentage is is water, and other things. It's written on the can. Then compare the price. You'll see there's also it's quite salty. There's uh, I can tell you that the, the frozen tuna which you can is quite which you cook yourself is uh, is very tasty. Okay, why do people say that whiskey isn't kosher? This will be the last bit of the subject we'll talk about today. Why do people say that whiskey isn't kosher? Um, it's not a new thing, you should know. Um, we publicized the fact that whiskey, whiskey isn't kosher a number of years ago, and we made a big, uh, a big noise, especially in uh, amongst Chabad. Who felt that we were um, taking away from them their only, our only pleasure in life, and if I bring them to drink Shiva's Regal. But um, that's a different issue. The, uh, <coughs> the way whiskey is produced is that they, uh, they take barley, they turn it into uh, an alcohol, which at that point is completely uh, transparent and clear, just like vodka. Then they put it into barrels, wooden barrels, and it sits there for a number of years. It absorbs the color and flavor which is in the barrel, both of the wood uh, and what is in between the staves of wood. And after whatever number of years, they take it out, 
they put it into a bottle and they sell it as whiskey. Many a number of hundreds of years ago, two or three hundred years ago, uh, the Scottish uh, were looking for wooden barrels. And they discovered at about the same time in Spain, they were also they were making barrels and they were using them for wine. There's a type of wine called sherry, which is a, a sweet red wine. And part of the production of sherry is they put it in a new oak barrel for two years. And then after that, they take it out and they bottle it, and that is sherry. The reason is they want to get the tannins and the flavors from the new oak, which gives sherry its specific flavor. After they've finished with these barrels, they have no more use for them because they need new oak barrels for the next batch of sherry. So they were storing up these barrels, not knowing what to do with them. And the Scottish came along, some, uh, must have been a Jewish fellow, I'm sure. He saw, he saw a good business deal over here. And uh, he said, listen, I'll tell you what, we'll, uh, we'll do your favor and we'll remove all of these wasted barrels that you really have no need for. And we'll just uh, take them away to us with us Scotland and uh, we'll save you all the problem of having to get rid of them. And so the Spaniards agreed. They took it to Scotland and they started using that for whiskey. They put in the whiskey in these barrels which had wine in it. And they discovered that the flavors which the whiskey got from the fact that the wine had soaked into the oak, so it had, it had a sugary wine flavor in the oak, and also the sugars which got trapped between the staves of the wood of the oak gave the whiskey a very, very nice taste. I'm sorry for all you Americans, but the fact is that Scotch whiskey takes a much, much better than American bourbon. It just doesn't compare. And the reason is very simply because of that. That's the only difference between Scotch whiskey and even American whiskies is the fact that in Scotland, according to law, the law in Scotland is, if you want to call it whiskey, you have to keep it in a barrel for three years, a wooden barrel. If you don't keep it in a wooden barrel for at least three years, you cannot call it whiskey, you can't sell it as whiskey. In America, you are forbidden to put whiskey or bourbon into a barrel which is not new. A used barrel, you're forbidden to do so. If you call it a straight whiskey or a straight bourbon. If you call it a blended bourbon, you can do whatever you like. But a straight bourbon or straight whiskey in America must go into a new barrel. And therefore, uh, its flavor is not comparable at all to the Scottish whiskies. So you could say, okay, look, so what's a little bit of wine? You know, hardly any taste, you know, it wasn't. Allah says differently. Uh, there is a, a chuva, only one major chuva about whiskey. It's brought by the Minchas Yitzchak. It's quite a long chuva, it's about 10 or 15 pages long. We discusses the whole issue. And during the chuva, he basically says, look, I don't really know that much about it, because I'm an expert on the subject, but... If an expert would say that he can taste uh, the wine, the taste of wine in the whiskey, then you would have to say that it is forbidden to be, to, to, to be consumed. Because the halacha is, if you taste a devar isur, you're tasting something which is forbidden, you have the taste of the isur, then you're not allowed to have it. That's what's forbidden. We contacted the experts, the people who make whiskey, the people who make the barrels, who repair the barrels, everything. And uh, contacting many of them, something like about 70 different companies, and uh, I don't know, two or three different companies that make the barrels. We asked them questions about what happened, how they do it, where they taste, if they do have the flavor, they don't have flavors, uh, what barrels they use, a lot of different questions. And what came about was uh, almost every single uh, manufacturer of Scotch whiskey uses wine barrels at some stage during the production. It could be they only use it for a short stage. They might put it in wine barrels for three years, bourbon barrels for three years, and whiskey barrels for three years. It all depends. Each time they put in a barrel, it gives it a particular flavor. So that's why they do it, they change barrels. So they might just put it in wine barrels the whole time, 
there's all different things. Each one, each uh, process of changing the barrel enhances the flavor of the whiskey. I mean, that's why they're doing it, because they want that flavor to go into the whiskey. They're not going to put it in a wine barrel if they want a, a taste of a, a bourbon in the whiskey. So obviously it, it plays an important part of the flavor. And they say they can. And uh, a real expert can even tell you what wine is in the barrel. You can taste the wine in the whiskey. The wine which is in the barrel, you can taste that in the whiskey. Um, we looked at it in great detail and it was very clear that that's the purpose that they do it. Not only that, we had other questions. Um, some people said they steam the barrels. And when they steam it, they do it with hot water or steam, that they're cushioning the barrels. You can cush a wood. Maybe they were cushioning the barrels and therefore it's okay. Uh, others told me that they burn the barrels. They burn the inside of the of the barrels. Uh, partly. And it has another, another thing as well. Firstly, the steam. Steaming the barrels, it's true, they do. They steam barrels. But what happens is they send the barrels from Spain to Scotland in pieces. Uh, they turn to pull it out into pieces, otherwise it takes up too much room. They pull it back, pull it down to pieces, they package each set up, it gets to Scotland, there's companies that put it back together again. Now, you want this, uh, you want this barrel to be airtight. And the way that you make a barrel airtight, it's wood. So you steam it, you put steam inside the barrel, and the steam is absorbed by the wood and expands the wood so that it makes it airtight again. That's how they do it. Old barrels that have been sitting around for a few years also that have dried out, they do the same thing. They steam it, right, so that it expands the wood, then they fill it up with water. That way it stays expanded. But the steaming is not hot steam. It's not 100 degrees, number one. Number two, you don't cash it with steam. Shulchan doesn't tell you you can cash it with steam. It says you have to cash it with boiling water at 100 degrees. There's not even a way of cashering. So even if people say they steam the barrels, it's not hot. And it's not cashering. So that didn't, that doesn't work. It's what? No, you can have cold steam as well. Yeah. It starts off at 100 and then you push it in. It doesn't necessarily uh, immediately uh, uh, condense. Yeah. Uh, you have a look at uh, actually pictures of how they're doing it. It comes out from a, a fairly high-pressured uh, uh, steam hose. Anyway, besides that, now they're, they're, the steam is not a way of cutting anyway. Secondly, they don't want it to remove. It doesn't remove the taste of the of the wine because they want the taste of the wine to be there. They're not going to remove it. That's the whole purpose. So the steaming is is done to such an extent that it, the, the taste of the wine remains. What about burning it? Say, so, okay, okay, they burn it, so, you know, burning is a way of cushioning, right? With fire, you can definitely cushion things. The reason they, they char the inside of the barrels is for two reasons. Number one, charcoal is a, uh, a filter. And what it does in alcohol, it removes unwanted taste. When, when you, uh, if you have a look at a, a bottle of Smirnoff, you'll see it says triple distilled or triple filtered. Actually, it's not distilled, but it's filtered. It's, no, it's triple filtered, not triple distilled. What they do is they put it through three different types of carbon filters. And that way, it removes any unwanted taste from the alcohol. That was actually the uh, invention of uh, Smirnov, who made the original uh, uh, vodka in, in Russia. That's what he did to get such a good quality vodka. We put it through three different types of carbon filters. In that case, he gave his vodka its, uh, its special taste. The, um, the charcoal in the barrel also removes any unwanted flavors from the alcohol. Besides that, it also uh, produces a compound. It's a chemical called lignin. Now, lignin uh, is produced when you burn oak. It's a chemical within the oak. And it, um, it has a flavor of vanilla, like a slight vanilla flavor. It's when you open up a, uh, a, a barrel, also in America, the barrels are charred on the inside. As you take out, when you open up a barrel, you'll have a vanilla smell within the, the barrel. 
because of the lignin which is produced. Lignin, what it does, in fact, enhances the flavor of the wine in the whiskey. So not only is it not detrimental to the flavor, it's the opposite. It enhances the flavor. So uh, on the basis of all of that, whiskey coming from Scotland and Ireland is awesome. Because you have the flavor, the flavor remains, the experts say that it remains, one after another, every one of them said, we want the flavor, everything they do is in order that the flavor should remain. So therefore, that type of whiskey is forbidden. The whiskey that comes from Scotland, it has a saying, it says that it's made from, from a plain barrel or something. I don't know of anything like that. I can tell you that every single one we checked, even those that didn't say that they were kept in wine barrels, um, at some stage during the process, they put it into a wine barrel. But if, if they put it in wine barrel, I mean, what is it? Because no, be not necessarily. No, no, a lot of them don't. Some of them only keep it in wine barrels and they advertise it. Uh, but a lot of them don't. But everyone, well, like for instance, even something like, you know, a lot of people used to think that plain Johnny Walker red label, which is a cheapish type of whiskey, doesn't go into wine barrels. That's not true. Because all Johnny Walker comes from a, uh, a distillery called, uh, the, they own a distillery called Tadhu. Tadhu Distillery, all of its whiskies go th for a time into wine barrels. Now that is something like 60% of most of the Johnny Walker uh, blends. So it's there. They don't say it, but that's what's in it. Everyone at some stage uses wine barrels. So that's the whole purpose of that's how they do it, that's how they make the whiskey good. Without that, it's going to be tasting like American bourbon, which they don't want. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. Let me leave it till next week. I promise I'll finish a quarter to seven because I believe it's time for you guys to uh, uh, take some nourishment in. Just something kosher. Keep it, I'm, going, I'm coming again in Yitzhak Hashem on, where am I going? I think Monday, one second. In Yitzhak Hashem Monday, I'll be here again. And uh, if you have any questions on those things, I'll be happy to... Uh, Do you have any other questions? Absolutely. That's why I got the list. Last time you mentioned something...